you can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. You can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. First one is coming from Londev. Londev is from South Africa. And it says, Dear Pastor Chris, I'm trying to be a good Christian, but I'm a lawyer and I'm always tempted to sin. I'm really confused. What shall I do? Should I quit my profession? Is there a way to reconcile the turmoil in my mind? A very honest question. But you know, the problem is not your profession. If, um, if the profession were not in service to humanity, maybe it would be a problem. But it's not a problem 
the profession itself is good. The problem is maybe something's wrong with how it's practiced by some, including you. Now what the Bible says is for us to let our light shine. He said we are the light of the world. And if you recognize what God has said about you, what Jesus has said about you, that you are the light of the world, and be that light in your world, then you'd find you're able to reconcile what you call this turmoil in your mind. It will solve the problem when you know who you are. So you are a light in a dark place. And so you function that way. Then there's a, a scripture I'd like to read to you. In Proverbs chapter 1, in verse 10, he says, My son, if sin has enticed thee, consent thou not. If sin has enticed you, he says, don't consent. Do not agree with them to do what's wrong. It's simple. You can. You can, you can refuse to do what's wrong. Because you are the light. So let your light shine. That's what Jesus said. Let your light shine. Let your light shine. So that's how simple it is. Being what God has called you. And um, it's important for me to quickly point out that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, if you haven't received the Holy Spirit, you'll have to receive the Holy Spirit. You need to do that. But uh, how can you do that? Several ways. First, as an act of your own faith in God's word, because Jesus said, if ye being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Which means you can ask and receive. Ask the Father and receive the Holy Spirit into your life. Alternatively, go to the church and talk to, the, to any of the leaders in the church. And let them know you want to receive the Holy Spirit and they'll tell you exactly what to do. And someone will minister to you, pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit. Hi, Pastor Chris. I watch your program on TV on a regular basis. I would like to ask, why does someone like me who likes to help everyone get help from no one? My life is so complicated. I can't see a light at the end of my tunnel. I need your help. Tell me what to do. I am really stressed out. Too many problems, no answers. Pastor, thank you very much, sir, for this wonderful opportunity to be on set with you once again. Thank you. Um, the answer to this question is straightforward, sir. Um, he said he watches your TV program regularly. And the reason for the TV program is to minister to you, to, to everyone, spirit, soul, and body. And how does that happen? How do you get ministered to? You listen to the man of God, and when you're listening to the man of God, you're listening to God because he speaks the word of God. And then there's an anointing on the man of God to minister forth to you. So every word he speaks is anointed. Your own part is to listen and to believe and act upon what the man of God is saying. So when you act upon that word, there is no way that your life will not be transformed. And you know, um, Pastor, he says he helps everyone, but doesn't get help from anybody. Um, when we help people, we're not looking up to the people to help us. We, we get our help from God. So you're looking at the wrong source. That is it. You're looking at the wrong source. You're not expecting people to help you. You, you, you do what you do, but you exercise your faith in the word of God and believe that it is God that will bring you help. Then he said, he said I'm, I'm really stressed out. Um, there's one scripture that just, you know, uh, comes to my dear to answer him. And that is Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. That's what Jesus said. You don't have to be stressed out. And I'll give you rest. So this is uh, Lynn, she, as, it's actually a lady. 
Yes, you have a word for her? Yes, Pastor. Thank you very much, sir, for another opportunity to be here with you. The question that comes to my mind when I heard the question is, is she listening to do? Is she listening well? Because if she has been listening to you, Pastor, she shouldn't be in this condition. That's the truth. And uh, now she needs to begin to listen well and do what she's been taught. Yeah, because she says, I watch your program on TV on a regular basis. Yes, sir. Okay. So if she's been watching on a regular basis, she should also be listening properly. Yes, sir. To learn um, the word. Oh, so you know, sharing, it, yeah. people, including myself, everybody that listens to you, everybody that listens to you, gets helped, gets blessed. So if she's been listening, she wouldn't be in this condition. So she now needs to look at her. So she should listen more. Listen right? well, sir. Okay. Now, this is very interesting. Uh, Ellen, there's something I would, I would um, add to what they've already said. You know, you said here, I would like to ask, why does someone like me who likes to help everyone get help from no one? And then you said, my life is so complicated. I can't see a light at the end of my tunnel. And you added, I'm really stressed out, too many problems. Now, um, the fact that you like to help everyone who needs your help is very good. It's a, it's a right place to begin because we must look out for a human need and reach out to meet that need. You are already doing something that's propelling you in the direction of success by helping others. Now, the next thing is, while you are at it and helping others, you must build your own faith because, you see, you can't help anyone more than the level of faith that you've got. You're going to have to build your faith. Don't start out by thinking whether or not you're going to get help from anybody. Start out by thinking of what God can do for you. See, because you have been uh, the hand of God to other people, a hand of help to other people. That means only God really can help you when you need it. But you're thinking now that you are in a complicated situation. Your life is complicated and you need some help probably. That's what you're thinking. You must set your focus on the Word, the Word of God. How are you going to do that? By listening. First, make sure that you are vitally involved in a church. Listening to Pastor Chris on TV or to any other minister on TV will not be enough. You must be a member of a local church, a local assembly, where you can participate, where others can also minister into your life as you're helping others. You see, the Word of God can minister to you. You can, be, you can have the corporate anointing of the, the fellowship of the brethren. You can participate in that. Your faith will become strong as the word is ministered to you. You need that. You need that. Actually, that is the major thing that you, that's the major step you need to take now. Be vitally involved in a local church where the word of God is being preached and taught. That is so important. So do that. And I guarantee you that you'd begin to see that light that you said you couldn't see at the end of a tunnel you'd find that even you have become a glowing light. So that's what you're going to do. And get to a position where nothing matters but God. How do I get to that stage? Well, this concept of dying to self is a, is a concept that uh, many Christians used many years ago. And uh, the fact that they used it many years ago doesn't mean that time has changed it. What I'm trying to say is that with knowledge, more and more
Christians are getting to understand the Bible doesn't really say anything about dying to self. You don't die to self. The Bible doesn't say so. Firstly, yourself is the spirit. What they think is that the self is like in sociology where you say the self is the real ego. So they're thinking that the self is the, is the flesh. But in scriptural teaching, your real self is your, is your spirit. And what is supposed to be crucified is your flesh. And that's the one that houses your senses. All right? So that's what the Bible says. And it tells us in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24 that they that belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with his affections and laws. So it's not to die to self that the Bible is teaching you. In fact, he also tells you in that context that you're already dead. So you don't try to die. So if you look at Galatians 5, 24 that I just told you, it says they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. They've already done that. But you say, how did that happen? Well, in Christ Jesus. Then in Colossians chapter 3, when you read from verse 1, the word gives you a clear teaching on this. It says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth, for ye are dead. He didn't say try to die. He said, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So, it's not a question of how do you die to self. He says, you already have died. What you have to do is to accept what God says about you. He says, your life is hid with Christ in God. And the fourth verse says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So, you don't need to die to self. So when you say, how do I get to that stage? It is not a getting to that stage. It is accepting that you are there. And when you accept it, it starts working in you. When you say, well, I'm dead to this. I'm alive to God. I'm dead to this. You don't try to die to it. You proclaim what the word says. I'm dead to this. See, I will not live to this. I'm dead to it. So you say it because that is what God has said about you. requiring individuals to go for screening for terminal diseases such as cancer or HIV whereby the doctors say that early detection can forestall some of the disasters that may be caused by such diseases is it okay for a Christian to go for such tests with the view of knowing one status is it contrary to our faith work well firstly um, there's nothing wrong or right in this it's got to do with individuals um, why would you want to find out if you've got cancer except you have fears that you might have cancer or you have fears that there's a possibility that you might have cancer all right the same thing with HIV you have maybe you have fears of the possibility that you might have the the virus so it's actually very much dependent on individuals and what they really think. Plus that, um, particularly for the HIV, you have to realize that there's still a lot of controversy surrounding the existence or non-existence of the virus, which, has, uh, which is yet to be purified. So it actually depends on individuals. Um, uh, reminds one of the Y2K in 1999 going into 2000. So, I think that uh, some of the controversy should be first laid to rest and then most people will be more um, confident to take whatever step they need to take. Pastor Chris, I just want to find out how to overcome arrogance with God's help. I've been seen as arrogant and would like to dismiss it from my life and personality. Well, that's beautiful. I think. Um, the very fact that you want to get rid of it is the beginning of your victory over it. But here, I would read God's word to you, beginning with James chapter 1, from verse 22. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Be ye doers of the word. 
doers of the word. In other words, God wants us to act his word. Act his word. Do his word. Be what he says we are. Act that way. Whatever he calls us, we answer and act that way. Okay. Now, Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 1. Be therefore followers of God as dear children, imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love as Christ also had loved us and had given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Walk in love. Now the key, the key to this is walking in love. If you walk in love, you cannot at the same time be arrogant. See, if you walk in love, you cannot at the same time be arrogant. So learn to walk in love. That's the beginning. Now I'm going to read to you from Galatians chapter 5 from verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. He says the fruit of the Spirit. That means the product of the recreated human spirit. He's not talking about the Spirit of God. He's talking about the human spirit. The born again spirit. When you're born again, there are certain things that come packaged in your spirit. These are now natural to you. The new life that you have in Christ. And it gives us a list. He says the fruit of the Spirit is love. It begins with love. So you got love inside you. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no love. Now, to be arrogant is to walk in the flesh. Let me read that to you. If you go upward to verse 19, the same chapter, the same book. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before as I have told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. See that? So, arrogance is of the flesh. And the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is different. So, you can walk in love and walk in joy and in peace and be long-suffering and be gentle with goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So all of this you can cultivate in your spirit because they're already in your spirit. Now you can groom them by walking in love. Walking in love. So from today, declare that there's no arrogance in your spirit. You say to yourself, I have no arrogance. I refuse to be arrogant. I will not be arrogant, but I will walk in love. I will walk in love. And you decide that and you will see the results in your life. Beer or wine? <laughs> no, it's not a sin to drink beer or wine. The problem with that is many believers around you think something's wrong with it. And because they think something's wrong with it, you've got to be careful, you know, how you do what you do, how you live your life. You know, the Bible says, if we sin against the brethren by wounding their weak conscience, we sin against Christ. So be careful what you do uh, um, with other believers. You know, watching you and thinking that you're, you're, you're carnal and you would be for not taking uh, those kind of things into consideration. Full opportunity. Sir, my question is about suicide. What's the Bible view on this? And what happens to those who were either once in the faith or are Christians and through ignorance take their own lives? Thank you, sir. Uh, Pastor, the life was given to us by God and no one was supposed to take his life. 
Um, you've answered this question, you know, it, it has come in different forms. And you said that people take their own lives um, for different reasons, and mainly because of selfishness. You know, maybe they can't stand the pressure of the situation, and now he's talking about ignorance. The life is, you can't take the life that God has given to you. God gave us the life, you know, so there's no justification for someone taking his life. You see, the problem, the, the problem really is, why did the man take his life? You see, the reason for taking your life is where, is where the sin is. Did you take your life because you were, you were confused about everything in life? You know, I remember there's an old song, a musician many years ago, who was singing a song, I've forgotten his name now, is it? There's no justice in this world anymore. Sometimes I ask myself, what am I living for? You know, and I thought, if there's no justice in this world, and you're asking yourself, what are you living for? You're making yourself a victim. If there's no justice in this world, what are you going to do? You do something about it. Bring in justice. So if you find yourself in a situation and you're thinking, oh, I, I don't want to live anymore because of this or because of that, why do you give up? Why do you give in to pressure? Why the fear? You've got to stop the fear. You've got to stop the unbelief. And you know what? In the least of those who will go to hell, actually the lake of fire, those that head up the list, the Bible says, number one, the fearful. Number two, the unbelieving. Before the least of all the others, all the other kinds of sins. Can you imagine that? The first person to get in the, the lake of fire says the fearful and then the unbelieving. So fear makes people commit suicide. Fear of the future. Fear of failure. Fear of what others think about them. Fear of the loss of their reputation. These are the things that make men commit suicide. Fear that they might not have what they need to take care of themselves. Fear. And then unbelief. They are unable to believe God. Why can't you believe that God can help you? Why can't you believe in yourself? Why can't you believe in your ability? These are the things that make people give up and commit suicide. And those things that make them do that, the Bible says, are sins. See the problem? So the man commits a sin by his own belief or by his fear and kills himself upon that sin. Terrible. can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now.
can watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. to him and I prayed but he's Antichrist what should I do keep interceding for him don't call him Antichrist anymore you didn't give birth to an Antichrist even if he says I'm an Antichrist say no you're not no you're not you belong to Jesus Christ keep proclaiming that he belongs to Jesus and you say I break the power of Satan off of his mind in the name of Jesus and it shall be so you keep interceding for him and the angels of God will guide him into a place of opportunity where he would receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's what you do. No, no one was born to suffer. We make choices. We make choices to listen to God or not to listen to him. See? We make choices to listen to even our premonitions or to reject them. And there's so many things we can do in life, even before someone becomes a Christian. See, there are principles in life that are just there for you to live by and you will not go through those sufferings. And then when you come to Christ, things even get better for you because now you can see through the Spirit. Now, getting better for you doesn't mean um, that materially you become uh, wealthy, even though you become an heir of God. See, you still have to make the choices. You still have to make the choices to accept or to reject, even though you're a Christian. See, so um, Jesus said something. He said, the poor you will always have with you. Why? Because people make the wrong choices a lot of times. And poverty may not be one's fault. Suffering like this may not be one's fault at the beginning, but when you wake up and learn the principles to live by, you can change your destiny. And God is a great God and wants us to change our destiny for good. And that's why he gave us his word, so we can act on his word and prosper by his word. And that's very important. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Since the inception of Pastor Chris Online, I have not missed any volume. And all my innermost questions have been answered. My question is, as Christians, the Bible says if we sin, we have the grace to obtain forgiveness. If we do sin and ask for God's forgiveness, do we still bear the consequences or repercussions of the sin? Thank you. 
Well, it depends on what kind of sin it is. You know, we have, there are sins against God and there are sins against men. And um, if you sin against God, he'll forgive you. But men don't always forgive. For example, if you stole something, God will forgive you. But the law may not forgive you. You may be taken to court. You may be found guilty and even put in prison. Now, those are the consequences of your sin. But this time, it's a breach against the law. So you have to understand, it depends on the sin. From God's side, he holds nothing against you anymore. But, you know, man has a different, uh, a different standard. So it depends on what kind of sin you're talking about. If it offended a human being, he may not let you go, even though God lets you go. But men have rights in their world. So it depends on what kind of sin it is. But be sure of one thing, that God will not hold those things against you after he's forgiven you. There will be no consequences from God's perspective. country that prides and is deeply engaged in wars against other nations what is God's thought about wars in this time and dispensation what is the fate of a born-again child of God who is enrolled in the military faced with the challenge of killing people at war either offensively or defensively well the first thing we have to understand is if you join the military you have pledged yourself to defend your country military wise so that's why you went in there. So we understand the military is not, is not for games. So if you went into the military, that's what you're pledged yourself to do. That means you believe in your country. You believe in the, uh, in the ideology of your nation. And you stand for it. So you're not only defending its territorial integrity, you are also defending its ideology. And that's why you're fighting. So that's important. So remember, you pledge yourself by joining the military to defend your nation's ideology and territorial integrity. And as far as that is concerned, when there's war, something that, when there's a threat against the territory or your, your ideology, somehow you may be asked to go to war. And if you truly believe in what your nation stands for, and nothing wrong with going to war because the Bible calls God a God of war and um, he did lead his children in war for those two things to protect their territorial integrity and also to defend their ideology and in fact sometimes to establish it in other places so there's nothing wrong with that at all but um, if you don't believe in, in case and that's why we pray for nations and leaders because leaders can make us as a nation follow the wrong ideology and even annex lands that we shouldn't in such cases we've got to pray so that we are not used to accomplish the wrong purposes that's why we must pray that's why the bible says you pray for leaders because they make decisions that affect a lot of us so you got to pray of course that also goes for for those who are um, forced into the army you know we call it forced conscriptions or maybe at the time of war and they say all the young men must join the army well when you're forced to join it goes back to the same thing do you believe in the ideology of your nation because that's what matters and um, uh, and the purpose now i know that um it's not as easy as individual belief um for example when there's a war you don't say, well, I believe in this war. I don't believe in this war. The point is not believing in a particular war. The point is believing in the ideology of your nation. That's what you call the broader picture. See, whether a particular war is right or wrong can be decided by the broader picture rather than by individuals who like it or don't like it. So always remember that.
and I want to open a karate club, but without Buddha meditations. I plan to use it as a soul winning avenue because I have more people coming there instead of cell meetings. Is it okay? Yeah, it could be okay, there's nothing wrong with that, but talk with your pastor. You know, um, looking at it just like this on the surface, there isn't anything wrong. But your pastor can tell about your level of maturity, uh, about the, the perception of the environment around you, what they're going to think about it, and so on and so forth. So talk with your pastor about it and he'll enlighten you further. But be sure to explain clearly to him or her what you plan to do. And because sometimes when you talk to a pastor, if the pastor doesn't get clearly what you have in mind, the answer can be no. See, but if they can get you clearly, communicate properly, and then um, you get the answer that you should get, whether yes or no. And whatever the answer is, be happy. have a talent. I've been praying about it because I don't want to stand before God with empty hands. Please explain how to identify my talents. How to identify your talents. You probably have several. If you have the Holy Spirit in your life, then you've got several abilities, several special abilities given to you by God. Now, the first thing you've got to do is to learn to pray in tongues. That means learn to do that frequently. Do it often enough. The more you pray in the spirit, the more sensitive your own spirit will be. If you keep praying in, in, in tongues, you become so sensitive that you can easily discover whatever God has deposited within you. So that's what you gotta do. There are a lot of you know, ways that people discover one thing, about, uh, one thing or the other about themselves, but a lot of times they may use canal methods but the Holy Spirit can help you identify what he's put within you. And whatever the Holy Spirit puts within you will always surpass anything that you would have had naturally. So don't look out for natural things. Look out for those things that the Holy Spirit gives you ability to, uh, abilities to do. Thank you for this live show. I'm a pastor and I want to know how to break strongholds in a country. I would also like to know how to use the Ming Shaka anointing and take advantage of the ministry of angels. We've got a lot of teachings on this. You, you, can, you can get the tapes, lots of uh, the DVDs or audio, audio formats. We've got them on all platforms. So if you get on our website, ChristEmbassyOnlineStore.org. You can make your pick. What, what do you think about this? Yeah, first of all, the, the first part of the question, how to break strongholds, um, I, I do hope that because what, what many people, when they talk about strongholds, they're thinking of spiritual forces that has held a nation in bondage. Um, breaking strongholds, God never sent us to break strongholds from nations. You take the gospel into the nation. The, the, the gospel breaks the, Bre breaks the strongholds. strongholds. You, see, you, you bring light and darkness goes. That's right. And the gospel is the light. The message preach of salvation. The gospel. You preach preach the, gospel. the word. The Bible says that Philip went down to Samaria and he preached the gospel. And the demons began that to flee. The they demons were crying yes, with loud voices. Yes, and, 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 Christ that's cried it. Loud voices he he, he didn't people. break the strongholds. Yes, sir. And, and because strongholds is in the Bible, it's not the, the it's not does not mean what a lot of people yeah. understand it to mean. By the way, strongholds in Scripture really has to do with ideas, theories, imaginations, reasonings in a society that have captivated the minds of men. He's not talking about demons, you know. Demons don't have a chance. Jesus has come. Jesus has fulfilled his ministry of salvation. For the world he's done it jesus has come he's died already he's been raised from the dead he has ascended he's concluded the ministry of reconciliation and we are saved you see understand that so satan has no chance the demons have no chance they can hold any nation down now when we come in they go we are their solution we're the solution for those nations we are the light of the world and when we shine 
Darkness has no option it receives. Right for Christians to sing or write worldly music? Well, you already qualified it. You said worldly music. If it's worldly, then the child of God got nothing to do with it, if it's worldly. Now, um, let me put it this way, just to help you straighten this out. If it's worldly, it means it is carnal and it is sensual. That's what it means when you say worldly. See, but it doesn't necessarily have to be, um, have to be, uh, um, spiritual to be good. Here's another thing. I mean, for example, someone is writing about nature. It doesn't mean he's praising God. He might write about the beauty of nature. He might write about his environment. He might write about history. He might, whatever it is. But when you say worldly, it means something that is carnal. It means something that is. Um, you know, the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. See, so if you have this defined it the way you did, then I, I think you do understand what you're talking about. Christians should not write worldly music because that's carnal. But there's nothing wrong if you are writing about other things that are decent about your environment, about politics, about, you know, about your country, you know, because we live in a world of human beings, and sometimes we seek to influence them for good, and that might have to do with some profession and whatever it is. But be sure it doesn't get to the point where you say it's worldly. If we study biology, for example, and we're trying to understand the functions uh, or the uh, how things work in an egg uh, cell or uh, in a in a bone, it's not spiritual. But it's not worldly. You see, we wouldn't describe that as worldly. And yet, it is earthy. You get that? When you say it's earthy, that means it's of this earth. But it's not described as worldly. If we study science and understand how things work in our environment, it's not worldly. See? So, um, that's why I said it depends on what you're really talking about here. You've got to be clear. And once you say it is worldly, then the way the Bible describes it when it is worldly is that it is sinful. And so Christians got nothing to do with that. All right, we'll just take um, maybe one or two more and move over to a different segment. An exam six times and I have not passed. I know I'm a success, but why have I not passed the exams? Okay, now I'm not sure. Um, okay, there's another part to the question. It says, also, I caught my eight year son watching a pornographic movie on the internet. How do I delete this from his memory? Okay, well, um, it will not be a matter, of, I'll stop with that. It's not going to be a matter of deleting it from his memory, but let him, let him understand what's wrong with this. You see, in life, it's not what we see that's the problem. It's our interpretation of what we see. He's got to know that those who got themselves nude on the internet were stupid. You see, he's got to know. He's got to be taught that it's stupid. It's some form of madness. What, why would what everybody covers you decide to expose. The very fact that uh, uh, sane people keep themselves covered shows that there's some insanity in getting nude and publicizing it on the internet. So get your child to understand it. After all, he knows when he's, when he's nude himself, he doesn't like to go out that way, though he's eight years old. He wouldn't like to go in public looking nude. He already knows as a child something's wrong with getting nude. And so you teach him that, let him know. So it's not the picture that's the problem. It's the fact that anybody would do that, you know, um, openly. So 
but you disabuse his mind from thinking that there's any intelligence in it. Now, the, the, the first part of your question is that you've done an exam six times and you haven't passed, and yet you know you, you're a success and you, you don't know why you haven't passed. Now, I'm not sure why you haven't passed yet, but I can sure say this. It is possible for you to pass this next time. Okay? Now, you be sure to study as you should. Take all the, the um, details into consideration. Pray for God's guidance while you are studying, and He can guide you in the study. All right? He can guide you in the study. And plus that, there's a special favor that can come to you. And I pray specially for you even now. That the next time you take that paper, that exam, that you do well. And get what you should have this time. Success. We gave you several options. The Christian and politics, the Christian polygamist, the Christian and healing. And uh, we said for the Christian and politics, this is scriptural for a Christian to engage in politics, especially in nations where politics is corrupt. A Christian polygamist, what does someone do if he was married to two or three women before he got saved? Does he keep the first wife and divorce the other two? Or does he continue with all three of them? You can discuss this on the blog. The Christian and healing. As Christians, we're not meant to be sick. But what does a Christian do if he or she has been prayed for healing and receives it, but the situation remains the same in the physical? Now, what you chose was the Christian and lottery. Is it right for a Christian to play the lottery? Wonderful. Now, how come a lot of you were interested in the lottery? Shows you're interested in getting more money. I'd like to explain the lottery to you because I realize that um, a lot of times many equate the lottery with gambling but I, I want to read to you some of the differences in the lottery in the um, operation of the lottery so you can understand it lottery is a contest in which tokens are distributed or sold the winning token or tokens being secretly predetermined or ultimately selected in a random drawing. Now, there's another way. A selection made by lot from a number of applicants or competitors. Third, an activity or event regarded as having an outcome depending on fate. So these are the three uh, methods that lotteries are drawn. Now, the difference between this and gambling is the inclusion of a wager. In gambling, there's a wager. You, you, there's a pledge. You make a pledge of something. And then um, with a hope to win it. Which, if you don't win, whatever it was you pledged is gone. Now, that's where people get into trouble. Some pledge their homes, some pledge their cars, some pledge their fortune. And win or lose until they are addicted to doing it and then um, frustration sets in and that's why a lot of times people are told to stay out of gambling but lottery is not gambling and um, it doesn't include the wager now am I recommending lottery not really but I just want to explain to you what it's about and um, the fact that in the Bible now, lottery comes from the word lots, so you remember that. Uh, in, in Proverbs chapter 16, in verse 33, the Lord is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. And that's one. And then uh, chapter 18, same book, in verse 18, the Lord caused contentions to cease and parted between the mighty. And then in the book of Acts, over in the New Testament, Acts chapter 1, verse 26, talking about the disciples when they came together after the ascension of Jesus Christ, Peter addressed them, being the leader, addressed them and talked about uh, the demise of uh, Judas Iscariot and the need for him to be replaced by someone else. 
and then he asked them to uh, cast their lots and in verse 26 it says and they gave forth their lots and the lot fell upon matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles now this is the only place in the new testament where they cast lots after this time the next chapter they receive the holy spirit and they could walk by the spirit without having to cast lots to find out what was the mind of god so the idea here is uh, casting of lots is not necessarily wrong in fact it's a game so the lottery is a game um, if something's wrong with it, it's just like a Christian not playing a game. So it's a game. You win or lose, but you're not making a pledge to it. So that's what it's about. So is it right for a Christian to play the lottery? It's okay, depending on the terms. So remember that. If the terms are not acceptable to you, don't play it. It's a game. Watch and listen to great and powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. Scroll down to see the preachers pictures. Click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers. Videos can be shared on all social media platforms. We need your help now. powerful messages from different men and women of God, preachers, prophets, teachers from all around the world on www.anointedtube.com. Hey there, this is Anointed Tube. Anointed Tube is blessing and changing lives around the world. We are a data hive of videos by preachers, gospel ministers, motivational and financial speakers from around the world. We need your help and monthly donation by clicking on the donate subscription button on the home page and also on the video page. You choose the amount you want to donate monthly. Nothing is too small or too big. We are targeting 5,000 people to subscribe now and we need your help. It is remarkably easy to navigate on the site. Simply click on the photos of any preachers of your choice in Africa, America or elsewhere shown at the top of the site. 
scroll down to see the preacher's pictures click on any of the pictures to start watching and catching up with videos from your favorite ministers videos can be shared on all social media platforms we need your help now